Welcome to Theological Table Talk. Uh, my name is Keith Stanglin. I'm the director of the Center for Christian Studies, and it's good to uh, be here with you all. I'm joined today, as usual, uh, by Todd Hall, the associate director of the Center. Hey, Todd, how's it going? Hi, it's going good. Good. Um, Todd, uh, for those of you who are listening uh, uh, on Spotify or Apple, remember that Todd is the king of memes. And so he's got a new one for us today. Will you just move over there so we can see? Maybe. Uh, the let, yeah. Get out of the way here. <laughs> yes. General Pauline letter outline. So if you're into kind of what makes a good, you know, uh, structure for epistles in the New Testament, you'll want to have a look at that one that's a classic um thanks for that uh, we're also joined today uh really happy to have mac sandlin with us uh mac is um, a teacher in the bible department at harding university uh, i've known mac for uh, a long time now i guess we met um when i started teaching there in 2005 maybe it was yeah. the next year when next we year, met 2006. you were 2006, you were doing some teaching there and came on full time not long after that. So um, Mac did his uh, PhD in theology at Dayton and uh, still teaches at Harding and is uh, really a great teacher and just a, a great guy to talk with. And so we wanted to have him join us today. So thanks for being here, Mac. Thanks, buddy. Glad to see you. Yeah. Uh, our topic for today, we'll just get right into it, is uh, it somewhat dovetails with our um, upcoming Journal of Christian Studies issue. That issue is on the theology and practice of singing in Churches of Christ, uh, which is uh, traditionally uh, an a cappella fellowship, um, and all of us, the three of us, uh, come from and are members in Churches of Christ, and we uh, like to sing, so it seems like a good topic. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, the, the journal issue is coming out very soon in January of 24, but um, we don't have an article on the greatest songs that are sung in churches, and so we thought we would do that for our conversation today. And I just wanted to ask uh, Todd and Mac for the three best or greatest or your favorite songs to sing in church, favorite hymns. Uh, and, and I'll have my three favorite as well. Just um, a word here at the beginning. Um, I'm not talking about songs that are important in the history of the church that we don't sing in church. <laughs> so... Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Uh, the ending of Handel's Messiah uh, is not in songbooks that we use. So you don't get to say that one. Uh, and things oh. like that. Okay, those are great songs, but we're talking about things that um, are sung or until recently were sung in <laughs> many churches of Christ and other uh, probably especially low church fellowships. Uh, and so even if, if, if you're not in a church of Christ, if you're at a church that sings, hopefully uh, what, this conversation will resonate with you. So is there anything else I need to say as we get started here? Nope, All right. I think that's good. Let's hear it. Um, your top three, one at a time, your first one, uh, not in any particular order here, Todd, but uh, let's hear yours first. What do you got? Yeah, this is not cool um, because I only had one child. So I never had to answer the question, which is your favorite child? And now for the first time, I have to. Um, I, I love good hymns. So um, I'm going to start with uh, A New Creature or Buried with Christ, which I think is the greatest baptismal hymn there is. Number 619 uh, in my substandard hymnal. Um, and I think that it captures really well sort of uh, both what happens in baptism, but also then the the, uh, the beginning of the process of sanctification, um, maybe better than any other hymn, I think. Um, you know, it's other hymns are great at, you know, what God has done and, you know, that sort of thing. But this one is sort of like 
on the other side of baptism, looking forward to a, a, a holy life. So that's my first one, not, not necessarily my favorite, but my first one. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. So this is a, uh, it's a Thomas Chisholm uh, lyric and uh, an L.O. Sanderson tune. Huh. So these two guys uh, collaborated on a lot of songs, actually. Thomas Chisholm was a Methodist minister and L.O. Sanderson, a Church of Christ minister. So uh, there are, uh, I love their collaborations also. Chisholm did a lot of other songs that um, L.O. Sanderson didn't do the tune for. I think his most famous one is, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> really famous. Really famous Chisholm song. Everyone knows uh, it. Uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness. Oh, that's a, oh. song. That's oh, yeah. a Chisholm song. Oh, but um, man, this is a very, uh, in some ways, uh, kind of typical Church of Christ song because we have a very high view of baptism. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the Methodist minister, Methodists <laughs> tend to not emphasize baptism as much, uh, traditionally as much as folks in Churches of Christ do. But this is, yeah, I think a very good theology of baptism. Yeah. Uh, so a new creature, if you're not familiar with that, I think we want to put maybe links to these songs if they're on YouTube so people can hear them sung. Uh, yeah, also, if they're uh, well done on YouTube. You know, in you the show notes. Sing a, little, sing a little snatch of it there for us, Keith? What's that? I said you don't want to just perform a little snatch of the song for us? <laughs> Buried with Christ, my blessed Redeemer. Oh, okay. You know I, that I one? Know that well, when Todd said it, I thought, I don't know this song. This is very unusual for an old Church of Christ song. I thought, but when you sing it, I think, oh, yeah, I know that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think. And we sing that tune on something else, too, don't we? It's a tune that sounds like I know another. That's another phenomenon that we have. Maybe other other fellowships do, too, where one tune and two or three different lyric sets mm -hmm. for it. Oh yeah. One set of lyrics and two or three different tunes. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's typical in hymnals, you know, because you have a similar meter and all of that in the poem itself. And so it goes with different things, just like, you know, amazing grace goes with peaceful, easy feeling and all those things. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, well, I, I always, I always love substituting amazing grace for the line. I want to sleep with you in the desert tonight. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's, I always felt awkward about that in ninth grade when we did that in youth group. I thought, I know the real words there. That's a little, <laughs> hello. Sleeping though, Max, sleeping. Okay. There's nothing yeah. wrong with sleeping. Uh, yeah, so this is an, an unusual, uh, back to Todd's song, uh, unusual because the title is not mentioned at all in the lyrics. So mm -hmm. that's another reason you may not recognize it. It's yeah. called A New Creature. But that's never said in there. It's about being new. It's it's the new creation that comes as a result of it at the moment of baptism. So yeah, uh, dead to the old, alive to the new. All those, uh, all that very biblical language in that song. And yes, a great song to accompany baptism. Yeah. Anything else for that one? Were you surprised? You? I was not. No. You looked surprised. Yeah, I'll take surprised. it. It surprised me. <laughs> but it's a good one. All right. Good. Mac, you're up. All right. Uh, I have several. Like, I was glad you said uh, in no particular order, because I love to make lists and rankings of things. This is a very hard one. Yeah. But yeah. one song that's uh, meaningful to me is Be With Me, Lord. Mm. You know, uh, I think this is another uh, L.O. Sanderson one. And Chisholm. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think I think all three of the songs that, that I picked, I relate to sermons that I heard. I always like when preachers preach a, preach a sermon and either drop the words of song hymns that we sing into it. Or I like sermons that's like, I'm just going to preach this hymn to you today. Mm -hmm. I've always enjoyed those kind of sermons. And uh, this one, I heard a sermon when I was at Harding School of Theology in chapel one day. There was a student who was speaking about the uh, about the presence of God. So be with me, Lord. I cannot live without thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. 
but the the third verse, be with me, Lord, no other gift or blessing thou couldst bestow could with this one compare a constant sense of thy abiding presence. And that was sort of his theme in the sermon. And I remember being very moved and touched that that this was this was a a lot of what the gospel was about. God coming near. Uh, I remember I always tell the the first passage I ever remember from scripture being moved to tears by maybe 15 years old or something and reading the very end of Matthew. You know, you're an angsty teenager and you you feel like you're all alone in the world, whether that's true or not. And I was reading Matthew, trying to be a good boy and read my Bible. And Jesus gave the great commission, you know, OK, got there and do the work. And I knew that it was in the back, you know, a post from the back of our, our church building. But the line that comes after that. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I just get, I get uh, emotional just thinking about that right now. And so then to have a song to say, you know, these songs that are prayers too. I like that too. These songs yeah. that are praying to God and to say, oh, here's my prayer. Here's what I need. A constant sense of thy abiding presence. And then my, you know, my work uh, academically is on the Holy Spirit and pneumatology. And so there's a chapter in my dissertation, that's all about the power and presence of God is a person. So when I sing this now, be with me, Lord, I think about the Holy Spirit. I imagine a dove or uh, wings of fire, like uh, from Pentecost, wrapping around me, hide me underneath your wings, that image. Hmm. And uh, so when my kids were born, I would, this was, I always try to think, what's the first music I want this child to hear as it enters the world? And for all three of my kids, I would uh, I would hold them on their, the first day when I would sing, sing this hymn to them, be with me, Lord, to, to ask that prayer for myself as a parent and then to pray that as a blessing on the kids. So I don't I mean, I think it's a great hymn. But for me, it's also just uh, gets me in my my heart because of this history with it. Yeah. It, yeah. Isn't there a, a, I think we're going to find with a lot of our songs, at least for me, there's, there is a history with it. Yes. It's something yeah. that, that makes a song, you know, uh, special. Yeah. Uh, us. Yeah. Um, Be With Me Lord could have easily been on, on my list as well. I, yeah. uh, I, for all those reasons uh, that you mentioned, uh, I love this song. Um because yeah. I sing it to my children, it's on your list. Because you sing it to your children, right there. That is <laughs> my my first reason for loving this song. Yes, you know, with having children, it's always appropriate. You can sing that when they're teenagers too. Be with me, Lord. <laughs> I know they are now. Okay. Oh, <laughs> song becomes more special over time. That's right. Uh, yeah, this is one of the songs I just remember singing a lot when I was a little kid at church uh and so this was a very familiar song to us and the uh, just the the lines in it the the words are just wonderful and they're poetic but they are um they're not too hard to understand like a kid can understand what's being said here if you just read the sentences and i just as a kid remember like but just the language, if lashing seas yes. everywhere about me. Yeah. I just that I, I remember that line and just thought it's just it's just painting a picture there mm-hmm. of the trials and storms of life and how we're praying that God uh, will be present with us during those storms. I just remember that one really standing out to me and just kind of fascinated me. But it's not too hard to understand what's being said in this. Yeah, you know, some some poems and songs, older songs, especially are so kind of ambiguous or evocative. It really takes, you, you got to dig into it a little bit and kind of figure out what's being said. This what one, is Evan Pinion? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but but this one, I mean, it's 20th century, but it's it's kind of old style, but it's not too hard to understand. I think it's just a good, you know, yeah. people that don't like kind of old poetic songs. I think this is a good kind of bridge to get them into seeing really meaningful lyrics that do what you want a song to do here. Um, yeah. And Looking I remember- like the line, that line of it, uh, Keith, that says, 
be with me when loneliness overtakes me. Yeah. And then, yeah. and so you picture someone sort of alone. I remember feeling that thing like alone feels like a dark kind of feeling. And then the next line is when I must weep amid the fires of pain. Yeah. So he does, he, he names real deal human experiences, but in images that resonate, which is what good poetry does in general, yeah. I think. No, it's a, it's a, it's a classic, I think. Um, and then I remember a couple of times um, just, um hearing this song and singing it you know just as an adult uh one time i was listening to the song on the way to work when i worked at harding and uh this song was on my cd and i just parked my car and didn't get out of it mm-hmm. i just sat there and listened to it probably sang it and it just brought me to tears in a way that it hadn't yeah. before and there's nothing really going on in my life and like an hour or two later, I heard that one of my friends and neighbors at the time, he went to church with us, uh, died tragically in a helicopter accident. Mm-hmm. Um, probably about the time I was, or you know, right before I was sitting there singing that song, and it just it resonated me, uh, resonated with me uh, quite a lot. I remember seeing that uh, at the lectureship, standing next to Everett Ferguson and and his wife Nancy and just it's a very moving song i think and then the last line uh when shall come the hour of my departure for worlds unknown mm-hmm. O lord be with me then uh and th- that language is sort of different in songs you don't hear that much i'm yeah. not even sure it's biblical you know it's sort of other t- songs talk about jordan uh, this talks about departure for worlds unknown but uh yeah it's just the language in in this song is so uh, rich and just great. Good good choice there, I think. Anything else on that one? All great right. Song. Um, I also went back and forth on all this, of course, and all of us. I I, I could do a hundred songs uh, here, but I wanted to do one that I think is. Uh, also fun to sing the other the other two i'm going to say maybe aren't quite as fun to sing but fun to sing seems like a, mm-hmm. a an appropriate not the most important criterion but an appropriate one um <laughs> for my favorite song um hallelujah praise jehovah that oh. is a fun song to sing. <clears throat> yeah it's, it's it's more than that of course but it is that uh i think um so this is um a paraphrase in, in some ways, line by line of Psalm 148. So mm-hmm. starts out, hallelujah. And then it gives the translation of that Hebrew word. Praise the Lord. Praise Jehovah uh, is what that means. And then it just goes through Psalm 148, which I always noted is number 148 in songs of the church. Yes. And I know most of the numbers to most of the songs here. Uh, so um, I'll always remember uh, Psalm 148 because of this song. Um, but if you know this song, I think you know why it, it's a good one. So it is biblical, very biblical going mm-hmm. through the psalm. So it's there are other songs that do this. And, and that course- was between that and the Lord's my shepherd was the first time I realized I remember one time I was reading along and uh, I think that Psalm was the Psalm reading for the day. And then we sang that song and I was, I don't know, 14 or 15, something like that. And it was like, Oh, we're just singing that Psalm. That's pretty cool. You know, so, <laughs> right. never know that before. You know? Yeah. So folks in reformed traditions <laughs> will be like, you can sing songs that aren't Psalms. I don't right. know did this. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, some of our songs, not enough probably, uh, do go with the Psalms. And this one, again, is it's, yeah, it's almost line by line through there. And just, so what I'm saying about the lyrics is good things to say about Psalm 148, but uh, using some of that old language, I just love, so it's about all creation praising God. And so it's just a, a great praise song, and it's one that, you know, I think evokes uh, this biblical language you see in other places about it's not just human creation. It's all creation that 
praises God that uh, is if we if we have the ears to hear and eyes to see it. So a lot of that is the the nature that praises God. Um, I like how it preserves some of that King James language, like all ye floods, oh, ye, ye dragons, dragons all. Yeah. When, we, when we sing that, I'm like, I wonder what people think about that, if they're thinking about it at all. But um, yeah, it's uh, that may not be the best translation of that word, but it's probably an okay translation, <laughs> whatever. Even these mythical creatures, these things we don't even know about in creation, you know, these all the scary things, they're just... As the Old Testament seems to suggest, play things to God, creatures that also join us in, in praising. Um, and then the way it, it, it sort of culminates in human creation, praising, uh, it, as the psalm does. Kings of the earth and all ye people, princes, great earths, judges all, praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and, and children small. So it's like all the... The whole church there, you know, yeah. young and old, it's intergenerational, every socioeconomic level uh, in this hierarchical society that we all, always have. Well, we're all equal as we sing praises to God. Um, yeah. And then let them all give praises to Jehovah. Yep. That's great. So it's pretty straightforward, but it's biblical, fun to sing. That is fun to sing, and I, that's the thing. Hopefully we can link to this because uh, this is one of those, sometimes I sing tenor, sometimes I sing bass, and I'll go back and forth on this one, you know, because both are so much fun to sing. Um, yeah, it's a great song. It's a good pick. I like the connection, you know, in uh, in Revelation, there's that great line about the kings of the earth coming into the city and bringing mm -hmm. their glory with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes, like, for people living in modern Western, you know, democratic republics like ours, it's hard to, it's hard to really have a sense of like the glory of a King, but like, I love to watch uh, the, the funerals and the weddings, the British Royal family, mm -hmm. all the, you know, messy stuff with that. I'm not, I'm not trying to comment on, but just the pageantry of it and a sense of there's dignity and glory that somebody has by virtue of their position. And that they bring that into the city. This is what, what does a king have to offer to God? He brings the glory that, that's that been given to him. He gives it over to God. It's, it's a wonderful passage. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, Todd, you're up. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, no particular order. This one's special to me, but uh, I uh, I love Tis Midnight and on Olive's Brow. Yeah. Great song. Um, yeah, just a, a beautiful song, uh, sort of here at the Passion, and I think it it appropriately captures uh, the synoptic Passion, you know, um, the weeping and blood and and that sort of thing. But then you you have this hint of uh, the Johannine in the garden at the end, right? The um, the the conquering Jesus, you know, who is comforted. Um, by this song that the angels alone know um but i it's special to me because so when uh maddie was born uh jenny did not grow up church of christ um she she grew up methodist and um so when we got married you know obviously i was ministering in churches of christ and so um she became church of christ uh and we had lots of great discussions but this was one of the songs that she fell in love with um and i can remember when maddie was born she would um, sit on the back porch I don't know, maddie was born in april and had to be hot so she would sit you know we're in texas it's always hot in may you know she's always on the back porch got to be 95 degrees or whatever you know and uh, jenny would sit and rock her and hum this song to her um and so that that meant a lot and then uh, I remember these words specifically coming to me uh, in in the hospital when Jenny passed. Um, the the last verse of this song, I don't know where it, it just came uh, into my head, and that you know the 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 song born from the ether plains, comforting the the dying. I it it just really 
impacted me. And so it always has uh, from then. I, it's one of those that, you know, you, you guys probably have these two. You, you put them in the service or you see them in the service and you know they're coming and you think, I'm never going to get through that. <laughs> I can usually get through about two, two and a half verses of this one. And then it's like, y'all just keep singing. <laughs> yeah. Todd, I didn't know, I didn't know that you'd married a Methodist named Jenny. My wife is, was a Methodist named Jenny too. All right. Hey, yeah. great minds think alike. Gotcha. <laughs> Neither one eats chicken, I'm sure. That's what, yes. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an inside joke from Stangler. We once had a friend who was under the impression that Methodists did not eat chicken. You're, you're we kidding? Back, I might think that. We thought that was a really bizarre thing <laughs> to imagine. Yeah, I still remember that. Uh, that is definitely a side note here, but yes. Uh, <laughs> I wonder to feel, I'm afraid. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. We, <laughs> it's it's uh, appropriate. I'll, I'll say why in a second. But yeah, we, we heard that, and then... Uh, I was I was just sort of racking my brain like I know a lot about Methodism, but I didn't know anything about a specific diet or abstaining from chicken. And I was <laughs> thinking out loud. I'm like, I've taught courses about, you know, that include uh, talking about Methodists. And I've never heard that. <laughs> and Max says, my wife's Methodist. <laughs> and I've never heard that. <laughs> it turns out we never heard it because it was crazy. <laughs> and utterly divorced from reality which the, is why uh, we've not encountered it but wonderful the appropriate <laughs> connection here and, and we'll leave it at this is that uh, uh the center for christian studies is doing a class starting in january on understanding our christian neighbors and one of those things one of the things we'll be talking about is what divides and unites and what de, you know denominations and what their distinctive beliefs and practices are. Um, ab abstention from chicken, uh, as it turns out, uh, contrary to popular opinion, is not one of the <laughs> distinctive marks of Methodists. Okay. Uh, That's very well but done. Anyway, but yeah, it <laughs> tis, um, it's okay. Uh, tis midnight and on Olive's brow. Yes. Uh, wonderful song. Either Plains is great language in that song, too. Yeah. Uh, as a kid, like, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I knew it meant something otherworldly and, yeah. like, read a lot of fantasy novels and such. Just, it, you could, I could kind of see it and then, like, oh, well, it's wherever the angels are. Hmm. And imagining what would that have been like for an angel to come and, anyway, it's just great language. I hadn't yeah. thought of that song for a while, Todd. I, 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 yeah, I love that song. And I, I, you know, what strikes me about all these, and I don't, we don't have to go down this road, Keith, you tell me we're not doing that today, but I just, the poetry yeah. of the older hymns is so rich and so deep. And I, I don't, I'm not aware of a contemporary song, say a song written in the last 20, 25 years, 30 years, 50 years, that has the same kind of poetic value that these songs have. Um, Maybe because I'm stuck in 19, you know, 32 or whatever in my, in my hymn selection. But it's just, you know, the, all of these are so incredible. Tis midnight and from all removed, the Savior wrestles lone with fears. E'en that disciple whom he loved heeds not his master's grief and tears. What, I mean, it's just so evocative. You know, the, the poetry there is so moving and evocative. And I just don't see, I just don't see that today as much. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way we talk. And so how can we praise God? Right. With this sort of, okay. We'll we'll handle that another time, maybe. But we but should encourage young poets. You know, and that's the mm -hmm. thing. I think that uh people don't do poetry anymore. This is S Anthony Eslin talks a lot about this, but man, mm -hmm. the young people do poetry. Start writing good poetry for the church. Yes. And if you can work in ether planes uh that would even be better cool yeah and dragons yeah and and dragons. Dragons. in the yeah. same one would be great if you could guess yeah. so on that fourth verse yeah the nether region nether is just old for low uh it's sort of the germanic uh language for low like the netherlands the low countries ether is high so the the 
celestial regions. Um, I've always uh, uh, wondered, though, about that fourth verse, the song that angels know, unheard by mortals are the strains that sweetly soothe the Savior's will. I love the words and what it's saying, and I still sing them. I'm wondering if uh, biblically and Christologically that he heard something that he had a leg up and heard something that mortals don't hear. And so this is the suffering of an immortal, uh, I don't know, omniscient, you know, and had sort of access to something in his grief and suffering that other mortals don't have or mortals don't have. Yeah. Anyway, just a Christological question there. Yeah, but it kind of goes said, back said... to... No, 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 no. Well, you know, Matthew's temptation narrative, right? Um, so at the end of that, the angels come and minister to him. Yeah. So I think it's kind of maybe reaching back to that a little bit. Okay. Good point. I do think it's about the angel coming and ministering to him. The question is, is Christ a mortal? And that is, is he a mortal? And there's a sense in which the answer is definitely yes. He dies the next day. Yeah. And there's a sense in which you, maybe this Keith will help salve your Christological uh, uh, sensitivities on this. <laughs> I like that language that Peter says about Jesus in Acts two. It was impossible for death to hold him. It, yeah. it, in a in a very real sense, because of who he was, it, it was impossible to imagine that death would hold him. Mm -hmm. And so there, he's mortal, but but he's not just that. Right. Uh, so, that is fun. We can't we can't explore all that Christology today, but I like when hymns prompt us to to wrestle with that or think about that. It's good use of their their work. Yeah. Very good. All right, uh, Mac, your second one. Uh, it's appropriate because you see the the tinsel and all around Keith's banister and the wreath behind him. I see lots of the decor. Uh, the best Christmas song is also maybe I think the best theological. Uh, song in the history of the church, and that is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. If we get through this and nobody does a Charles Wesley hymn, uh, that's a, that's not legit. Uh, <laughs> Charles Wesley, I think, just that the, he's sitting around eating a piece of chicken and thinking about uh, <laughs> the great mystery of the Trinity. <laughs> but uh, I love I love every verse to the song. I love Christmas time. I love Christmas songs about the nativity. And the poetry in this one is is really excellent. It's also really fun to sing. Um, but it's another one where I connect with a sermon. Uh, I remember Monty Cox. Monty was my most formative teacher in my life. And I was on the Living World Religions field trip with him in December uh, when I was an undergraduate. We'd been visiting all these different uh, religious places like uh, a Baha'i temple and a Sikh service and a, a Jewish synagogue service and uh, went to a mosque and a, a Buddhist service. We went to do all this stuff with other religions. Sunday morning, we, we got up and we went to worship with uh, a church, a little church there. And Monty preached the sermon and he was preaching uh, this, this hymn. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. I, I think that's probably as good a piece of Christian poetry in the English language as I've ever encountered. I just think it's unbelievable. It's fun. It fits the season. But but it's rich, deep, Trinitarian and Christological theology. You can you can quibble with his veil, the right word there and such, but he's getting at it and he's getting at, at it powerfully. So I, I I love, love, love this. It's probably the best hymn. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's probably the best hymn in English, I think, that we have. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I love that one. I love Christmas songs, but, I, you know, I think Wesley was so good. Come Down Long Expected Jesus, to me, competes with that just in terms of the lyrics. It's, woof, it's good. Oh, man, I mean, you know, we could get us love divine, all loves excelling. Yeah, joy. that's on my list. Hey, too. hey, 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 hey. <laughs> We're taking Guys, you, 
You get three total. So Todd, you've already given us your third, and Mac, yours. No, 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 no. That's not uh, the third. I'm just bringing it up. Oh, are you gonna go the? I mean, so uh, this I agree is. I would say um, it's. I don't know if I'd say it's like the best and you know the theologically and everything, but at least for the question of Christology, of incarnation. If you're asking the question, why did God become man? This is, I think, the best. And <clears throat> expand to the other verses, like a lot of Charles Wesley hymns, we get three, and they're not quite put together the way he put them together. Uh, but there are other, uh, come desire of nations, come fix in us thy heavenly home. Fixing us thy humble home, rise the woman's conquering seed, bruise in us the serpent's head. Now display thy saving power, ruined nature now restore. Now in mystic union join thine to ours and ours to thine. And others like that. But you get this, I mean, it's the joining of, of human of divine with human nature in order to restore human nature you really get and there's sort of early christian eastern christian recapitulation mm -hmm. there just one of the best statements of that in that verse uh so it's yeah i think a, a excellent song uh hark how all the welkin rings is the way he wrote that first line that george whitfield change to hark the herald angels sing <laughs> so we can thank whitfield <laughs> welkin that's an old uh, english word for we were looking that up recently todd yeah Heaven or something i can't Sky remember yeah yeah i don't know good good song i wish there was somewhere we could look that up real quick yeah <laughs> um all right uh good i'll uh go to my second one which i could change now but i will go ahead and say is love divine all loves excelling fabulous song so yes we're gonna get a couple of charles wesley's in here uh which is at least as good as the chisholm sanderson collaboration <laughs> uh in the, in the history of uh english hymnody so yeah uh one of the Perhaps the, the greatest, along with Isaac Watts, certainly 18th century, and I would just say ever, uh, English uh, hymn writers. Um, but Love Divine is just an excellent song um, about uh, salvation, and particularly the, uh, I mean, a, a lot of it is kind of, it doesn't use the, the term entire sanctification, but it's um, leaning toward that that's the, the point here is that we are saved in order to be perfected by christ and to to be restored and that's that's yeah what the song is is really about and then uh, leading up to that that last line um uh, mm. about our whole salvation perfectly restored in the Till we cast, uh, uh, let's see, change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. That's got to be one of the greatest lines in, Unbelievable. in English hymnody. Uh, and so uh, I like that song. Uh, it, both tunes I know are good, but the one that's, that goes, uh, Love divine, all love's excelling joy. That one, I think, is my favorite of the two tunes. This one, uh, I just sang a lot to myself. I'm very easily suggestible when it comes to like uh, songs. If I hear just some familiar song, then I'll be singing it the rest of the day. I think a lot of people are like this. But even yeah. like a line of the song, if it appears to my eyes, then I'll have the song the rest of the day. And I worked at uh, two different at two different times um in uh in San Diego at Point Loma Nazarene University in their Wesleyan Center. Mm -hmm. And in the Wesleyan Center they had a, a stained glass of of John and Charles Wesley and a, a line from this song Love Divine. I don't remember which line it was, if it was just the opening line or the ending or something in there they had just on the wall there. 
And so this song was always on, and I would walk to and from, you know, my apartment that I had on campus to my office and I would just be singing this song <laughs> all day. It seemed like every day. And, I'm, and it occurred to me at one point, why am I always singing this song? Oh, it's because I see that line when I, when I, uh, when I leave or walk in. So you could uh, do worse for sure. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that the line on the wall didn't say nobody fills my heart like Jesus. <laughs> Preview of next podcast. <laughs> I uh, I love I love that song too. We when I teach a class on pneumatology, uh, we have a number of prayers and hymns that we you know begin class with or incorporate. And I always say this is our this is our best. If Hark to Herald Angels Sing is our best Christological hymn, this is our best pneumatological hymn. Hmm. Think about Augustine's notion of the Spirit as the love of God, uh, love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven cut to earth come down. Hear that fruits of the Spirit language in there too. With, uh, and then I, I just agree with you, that line changed from glory into glory till we cast our crowns before thee. It's, it's just, yeah. Yeah. It's so good. And, and biblical, of course, the glory into glory is from second Corinthians, uh, yeah. casting the crowns before the throne of God is, uh, the scene from revelation. So, um, the way he weaves those in there. Yeah, and and thank you for pointing out the pneumatological reference, which I didn't mention, but that's that's huge. That's what it's talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, and the next line of that first verse uh, says that joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling. We are the dwelling of the spirit of God. He dwells yeah. in, in his people. And the and, beginning of verse two with breathe, oh breathe, thy loving spirit yeah, into every troubled exactly, breath. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's great. I know somebody, I can't remember who, but I know somebody that actually they sang this song at their wedding, which I thought was an interesting wedding hymn. But, uh, you know, it kind of works when you think about sanctification, getting married is marriage is part of being sanctified. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, anything with love in it, it's going to work for a yeah. <laughs> wedding ceremony. So. All right. Good. All right. Uh, Todd, you're third round yeah you just took my third one thanks um which one yeah. love divine yes yeah. really yeah okay so we should have organized uh, this conversation huh and say so we should have organized this conversation yeah. <laughs> yeah. no no you have to have it i'm sure we had alternates <laughs> oh yeah i've got i've got nine on my list so uh and and that's just because i stopped so i'm gonna go with sort of the classic uh one that everybody loves and that is it is well with my soul Good song. Uh, incredible poetry, great song, and fun to sing. Um, it, it sort of ticks all of those boxes. And I think that, uh, that with all due respect to the end of Love Divine, I think that the second verse of this song may compete with it for greatest um, Christian poetry. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Uh, and I think that, you know, give the, the background, everybody knows the story um, of how the, the song came to be. And, and that helps understand it's a it's just an incredible song for, uh, you know, I, I do a lot with grief. It's a great grief song. Um, it's one of those that you sort of you find a way to bear up and to take the peace that you find there in verse two, which kind of provides the cement for everything else right it's verse two that makes verse one possible it's verse two that makes looking forward to verse three possible um so it's just, yeah i just, i love love the love. forgiveness of sins namely yeah yep. yeah exactly Salvation. Yeah, they're nailed to the cross and because of that whether i've got peace like a river or sorrows um like sea billows either way i've learned to say it's well and i think that's great i think it's a great song for our contemporary culture, you know, for, for our contemporary Christians living in this culture where there is all this angst around and there is, you know, uh, you think about like po the political divide or all these other kinds of things. If we could just get Christians to actually live out this song, people would be a lot more relaxed, you know, <laughs> a lot less yelling at each other. There would be a lot more recognition of, you know, Everything is going to work out. God is in charge of this thing and not us. Mm -hmm. 
So in case there's anybody that doesn't know about... Yeah, tell the story. Tell the story. Horatio Spafford, give us the short version. <laughs> I mean, we do, but there may be people who don't. Who yeah. have so, Well, as I understand it, uh, right, he, he lost, and I can't remember whether it was the whole, his whole family? His was children. It, his children, okay. Wife it, sent a telegram that said, safe alone, right? Wow. Uh, Matt, you tell the story. Yeah, yeah, yes. This is, yes, you're going to need to tell the story. <laughs> so I, I think, I th I'm just working, remember, I think that's right. There was a yeah. shipwreck. He went across early mm -hmm. and they came along. His wife and kids came out, came across after him and uh, their boat sank. And uh, he was waiting, desperately waiting for news on what had happened. And I think he got a telegram from his wife that said, safe alone. Yeah. Uh, that all of his children had drowned and he wrote this song. Hence the, the sea billows, right? Is not just poetry. Yeah. It's the thing that killed his children. So it's, I mean, my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Like just a testament of faith, though he slay me yet will I hope in him kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like poetry to us, but I, you, you, you got to know when he's putting this out there, man, this is, this is yeah. really, really funny stuff. And also the version I've heard is that he was actually um, sailing back yeah. to that spot. Mm -hmm. as yeah, he was that's right. that's right. yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think that's what I heard too. Yeah. Wrote it when he comes to the place where the ship was. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, that's a fine selection. Um I think in that second verse, also, I've always thought you got to have the whole second verse because if you stop, <laughs> my sin, oh, the bliss of this glory, <laughs> my sin, <laughs> not should, in part, but the whole, should the whole on, thing. Yeah, we should do one on like mess ups of songs. I remember, <laughs> I think I told you this, Keith, we did, uh, I, I, I do a short song after the Eucharist that's sort of just devotional, you know, and that sort of thing. And we did, uh, Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Mm -hmm. And the song leader led the first two verses and stopped. <laughs> and so when I got up to do announcements, I said, I just want to assure everybody, we also love the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's like, you got to do all three, buddy. I uh, <laughs> missed the Trinitarian reference. <laughs> My sister uh, always loves when we sing at church. Are you sowing the seed of the king? Dumb, Dumb brother. brother. <laughs> she loves to point at me during that song. Yeah. All right. So that's your third one, Mac? Oh, no. Absolutely oh, okay. not. I think that song's not that great. Uh, no, my third one is Just As I Am. Oh, hmm. great yeah. song. Yeah. I mean, it's about it. Well, it, it for people of a certain age, it may feel older than it is. It is a 19th century hymn, but it was mid 20th century that this song became the standard for revivals. It is it is the classic invitation song. So in Church of the Christ, th this was Jimmy Allen's song. Yeah. In the water evangelical world, this was Billy Graham's yeah. song. Billy Graham's autobiography. It's titled Just as I Am. But I, I have actually, this is an interesting fact about me. I have never heard a Billy Graham sermon uh, in my life. Yeah, me neither. Uh, yeah, so I, to me, this is Jimmy Allen. Jimmy yeah. Allen's another teacher of mine. Uh, mm -hmm. Had him for Romans. And I can't hear just as I am. I hear, if you, some of your listeners may remember uh, Brother Allen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to thee. Lamb of God, I come. He had a cadence to it, how he said it, and That's his kind of gravelly, gruff voice. But I can remember singing this song as a, a, a teenager and thinking, I'm pretty messed up, and I'm going to come to God like this. Mm. The story behind the hymn, of course, is that the, the author had lapsed in her Christianity. She was an invalid and had suffered for years with feeling useless, worthless. Minister came to her and talked to her, and she couldn't talk about it. And he said uh, uh, something about it. She said, Somebody, how, do I, how can I come to God? He said, come just as you are. And those, those words stuck in her mind, and she wrote this hymn. And 
and it, it's been recorded by everybody. Willie Nelson has a beautiful little guitar version of it on the Redhead Stranger album. Huh. It's very moving to me. If you know that the the story of that album that he tells, it's the moment of redemption, and and, it, and there's no lyrics. You just he's trusting that the audience will know the hymn and recognize just the you know the 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 melody kind of plucked out. I love that about it. But it, it's it's just so powerful. Um, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Yeah. And that, I love this line, and that thou bidst me come to thee, that, that he is inviting us just as, just as I am, just as I am thy love unknown. I didn't even know it. And it's the thing that has broken every barrier down. Yeah. Powerful, powerful song. <clears throat> it's honest. I, I yes. think that's what I like so much. It's just, it, it, man, yeah, it, it, it breaks you and it needs to, you know, that's the thing. It, it takes sin seriously. Um, it's not baggage that we're carrying around or not something that happened to us. It's us. And yeah, that's good. That's good language, Todd. How about this verse four, just as I am. Poor, wretched, yeah. blind, mm -hmm. sight, riches, healing of the mind. Yea, all I need in thee to find. Amen. And that's that's one that I think I probably didn't understand as a kid. It's just throwing out these adjectives. <laughs> but it's saying, right, I come just as i am i'm poor wretched blind and then here's what you get when you come sight yeah. riches healing of the mind all i need man that's uh that's good it's it's a song too you know the joke was always that you sang a hundred verses of just as i am you keep <laughs> singing it over and over but yeah. i'm always like hey if you didn't sing all six verses you didn't you missed out the, the verses yeah. are good yes yeah. I, I, this is a, a positive podcast, so it's it pains me to say this, but did Jimmy Allen also say, "I come broken to be mended, <laughs> I come wounded to be healed"? <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? I do, but you know what? I actually, I actually don't. I don't uh, disdain that. I, I like that. I, I it feels to me like somebody is is speaking in their idiom this same thing and i i like that they're trying to reach back and grab it and i, I do come broken to be healed I do come you know or to be mended I, I i think i think it's like i'm the the old song is enough for me but when my students sing the the new little edition you know the the bridge there that shifts it it changes it but but i i, I can even enjoy that i like i even like that well, you're a more tolerant man than I am. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. I already that's, knew that. They, that's the comment you'll hear a lot. Mine uh, would say liberal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, what I don't like about that, if we're, I mean, since we're going negative, way to go, Keith, um, is it, it like, you, you, yes, it comes into a modern idiom, but the problem is the modern mm -hmm. idiom is a problem, I think, right? So, everything becomes psychologized. Um, I think about like Truman's um, uh, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. These are kind of uh, things that have happened to me. I come broken to be mended. You know, I come wounded to be healed. Um, it, it, it almost sounds like we're sort of, you know, not taking responsibility. So it, it, in that sense, it kind of undoes what you have with Just As I Am, which is the I'm a, I'm a, I'm a worm, you know, um, those kinds of things. Right. And this is like, Hey, I've had all these bad things happen to me. And when I come to you, 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 you accept me as I am that sort of thing. Anyway, that's my uh, thoughts. I don't know. I mean, like if the old one says poor, wretched, blind, and then promises sight, riches, and healing of the mind, the new one says, I come guilty. What am I looking for? Pardon? come broken what am i looking for mending to be fixed 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I think you can read it that way, but I think there's a more charitable, more generous read than that that doesn't demand it. Well, uh, I'm, all about, I'm all about hating on some new songs, so I'm fine. <laughs> I just think this one is not as liable to the critique. Let let let, let me uh, give it a try then. <laughs> I don't feel as, I don't feel as strongly as Todd about that. Um, the office, I mean, the listeners need to know that before we started this podcast, Keith says to me, "No, we're not going to go negative. <laughs> I don't want to hear any." You're right. Of new songs, but please, <laughs> Brother Stanglin, tell us what's wrong with coming broken to be mended by God. No, no, no. So <laughs> his critique is different. <laughs> uh, I think standing alone, those words are fine, and they say, it, like you said, in a new another idiom. What is it? Charlotte Elliot said, "In just as I am." Um, my analogy here would be uh, Oh Sacred Head, which I noticed nobody mentioned. It was as... number four for me. I, I wanted to do it. Oh, so okay, I'm okay. Uh, oh Sacred Head, now wounded. Uh, the uh, second, usually the final verse that uh, we sing in our hymnals is uh, <clears throat> What Language Shall I Borrow? To thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. Oh, make me thine forever, etc. Uh, so that's not the way we talk in many ways. And it's not the way not only the new generation, but my generation and the previous one talked. Bernard of Clairvaux talked that way. You know? <laughs> None of us talk that way. It is, it is like it says, borrowed language. So we're borrowing language uh, to speak something that's profound. Um, there's another song that I like on its own. There is a name I love to hear. Oh, how I love Jesus. Now, yeah. fine. Now, what if I see for the Lord's Supper, <laughs> we sang, oh, sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down and you're gearing up for that second verse, and then we go, Oh, how I love Jesus. <laughs> oh, Here's a how I love Jesus. Oh. <laughs> and then it's over. And because some person decided to take over a song that was just fine on its own and mix their mediocre song with it, <laughs> on its own is fine, now we never sing that second verse again, and no. nobody knows it. And uh, I, so that's my question: is why, like, if you like poor wretched blind, sight riches healing of the mind, then I think you can't be a huge fan <laughs> of the fact that every time it says "just as I am," what we really mean is the first verse, <laughs> and then this other thing. That's all. So I have nothing against coming broken to be mended as much as <laughs> why did we have to do that to that song? Like, let's make it an appendix. But let's don't take away "just as I am." Thy love unknown has broken every barrier down. Because that says more than the other new song says. <laughs> come join us. Come join us this semester in the chapel at Harding University. We have sung both the new one with the uh, "I Come Broken to Be Mended" and also one week sang all seven verses. Okay. Of the old one. And I remember, like the students were all, you could hear them sort of like they were into it, and then by the fifth verse, they were kind of like, "We we've done this five times," <laughs> and I thought, "It's good for you. Just hang in there." <laughs> Nobody came forward. <laughs> I mean, with seven yeah. verses, you got to well, come forward. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope what I'm saying makes sense. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's the loss of of yeah. the old one and covering up a new one with it. And yeah. Yeah. If, anyway. if, what, if what we're talking about is losing something, then sure, of course. All right. So what's what's the what's the next one for you? The last one for you? Yeah. Last one is a, a new one that I think uh, does a better job uh, than some other new ones. Uh, it's called My God and King. It is uh, a song that will be unfamiliar to most listeners, but we'll put a link in the show notes. Unfamiliar, Mac? I've never heard of it. It is a, a paraphrase of Psalm 84, 
Uh, it was written by uh, a, a Russian brother in Christ called Kostya Zhigulin um, and translated into English. Uh, it comes as part of uh, our friend Mark Ship's uh, Timeless Psalms. So uh, these are all new translations of the Psalter. So I'm plugging timeless here in some ways. Uh, new translations of Psalms and set to brand new tunes. Um, and I think published by ACU Press. Um, but this uh, song is one of the best ones in, mm -hmm. in those collections. And yeah, it's just a, it's a simple three verses and a simple chorus, but it's been arranged in many different ways for choirs since then. I only know it is probably 20 years old or so, maybe less. Um, I think it was written after 2000. I first heard it when um, I was in St. Petersburg, where they, the, this, the songwriter uh, attends church at the Neva Church of Christ there. Um, and they have a choir there. It's a very uh, musical and, and singing church. Uh, I was teaching there in 2008, and uh, they handed me a CD of these recordings. And so that's sort of a memory I have that goes with this song and just remembering being there for two weeks and teaching and the people I met and hearing these songs sung for the first time uh, that, that I'd heard them. And it's just uh, a lot of them are, are wonderful, but this is, I think, at the top of the mm -hmm. the heap there. Um, so we'll we'll put that in the show notes. My God and King. Yeah, and you know, it's also like you can do it as a choral piece, but I think it's <clears throat> utterly singable. Like a congregation won't have any Absolutely. problem singing the song. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I know. I mean, I'm not contradicting or anything. I just think. Yeah. That's one of the cool things about this song is that it's actually congregational i mean you could you could really pull it off and it's one of the most beautiful songs so dad and i were there in 2004 or 5 i think mm -hmm. and uh that was before they had cds or anything and so they they just gathered around us you know in that little room that when they would say you know goodbye and you'd have your yeah. little goodbye yeah. party they just yeah. gathered around us and sang it to us in a circle and it was like Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And they sang it in Russian, you know, at the time. Yes, I didn't yes. even know what they were saying. <laughs> but uh it was, yeah, it was amazing. It was beautiful. So that's a great it's a, song. It's a song that every church of Christ can sing and should be singing. Should There's be singing. No so if, yeah, if you get anything out of this conversation, if you don't know that song, uh look it up and and get the get the music for it and introduce it to your churches. Um, so Psalm 84, um, how beautiful are your dwelling places, O oh Lord, uh, is sort of the theme there. Uh, good. So uh, for all of us, you know, we could uh, come up with many other of our favorite songs. This is the ones we, we came up. These are the ones we came up with now. Um, I was talking with uh, uh, a buddy just this morning, uh, Stephen Crouch, who does a blog with uh, his uh, brothers, Crouch, also all thoughtful people. They did one a few years ago on songs and uh, got people, I think, kind of riled up with their list. And so I'm wondering, uh, listeners, if you want to comment on YouTube or other places here, uh, did we get it right? Are there other songs that uh, we missed? What are your favorite songs? Um and did we, uh, you know, do you like just as I am? I come broken to be mended as much as Mac does. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let us know uh, in the comments, maybe. But I'm also just wondering really quickly here, guys, uh, what are some observations we have about these songs? Or let's say in light of these songs, just about singing in churches. We didn't, uh, some of this came up in passing, but are there things we're looking for in good songs that we need to be um, practicing and teaching in our churches and handing on to the next generation? Are there criteria that are, are kind of common in these songs that we could say, here's what makes good songs? What do these songs that we've mentioned say or imply about the purpose of singing? What is What are these songs, what are we asking them or wanting them to do ideally? in a congregation of uh, 
an assembly of worship um, this day or over time. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We, we, These songs are meant to be the words of the church, that the church speaks to the church. And so they ought to, as soon as we good, good hymns, ought to proclaim the gospel. And one of the things you notice in a lot of the songs that we mentioned is good theology. That is to, to take a complex or a rich or a deep idea and to express it really well. That's what good poetry is. And the content is the truths of the Christian faith, the truths of the gospel. So we, we didn't do a ton of songs that were like singing to one another. Most of our songs were singing to God, but there's songs we sing to God and to each other. So they mm -hmm. have this teaching function. I, I'm, I'm all often struck by, in our tradition, how little we teach about kind of like systematic theological topics, but how much we sing about them. So when I teach the Trinity at my church, the first thing I do is read relevant passages. And then I say, but of course, you all know this because you've been singing it for years. And then we just yeah. point to the songs that we sing. And I think I think that's what good songs do is they they take the, the content of the faith and they uh, speak that content to one another in good poetry. Good. Yeah, yeah. that's good. I was just uh, there in the latest JCS. We'll have a, a lengthy quote from uh, Alexander Campbell about this. Um, but I, just quoting him a little bit here, the Christian hymn book next to the Bible wields the largest and mightiest formative influence upon the young and the old, upon saint and sinner than any other book in the world. Poetry and especially good religious and moral poetry emanates as much from the heart as from the head. It partakes so much of the spirit of its author that it ins insinuates itself into the soul with more subtlety and power than any other language of mortal. Allow me, said someone, to write the ballads for a nation, and I care not who enacts its laws. Permit me, I also say, to dispense the psalmody of a community, and I care not who dictates its creeds or writes out its catechism. And uh, it goes on from there, but I think that's I think we don't really think about how formative songs are, but like Mac was saying, that's just such a, it, it it's a, just a different way to really inform people in terms of what it is that they really believe, what they confess and, and, and how to live. Um, and so we ought to take it very seriously too. Yeah. Good. Well, um, these are some good observations. I think just the theological, uh, uh, the song is a vehicle for good theology, right? Or, or let's just say theology it can be a vehicle for bad theology. <laughs> if, a, <laughs> if, a, if there is such a song uh, that would uh, convey yeah. that. Maybe there could be. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but like I said, that's another podcast. <laughs> it's all positive. I told y'all to be positive because I knew I needed help. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> Uh, I, I, we did pretty good. That was about what seven minutes of this hour podcast, so it's not bad. Yeah, pretty that's good. Right. So, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, we and we do have other. Uh, there are other uh, articles in that issue of the Journal of Christian Studies. I think a couple of our articles talk about criteria for good songs, and that's that's something I think we should take seriously when we we're thinking about our canon of songs uh, in churches, and also. Um, new songs that we're introducing, uh, it, or or even writing or encouraging others to to write. Uh, but it's interesting because their songs we often, I mean, we get caught up in the tune, or we've heard them our whole lives, and we sometimes don't think about the words uh, uh, so much. So I like just an opportunity like this to mention the songs, but also to get to talk about the words. Mm -hmm. And I found over the years, if it comes up in a class or a sermon where I talk about the words, there's always somebody who says, I never really thought of that. Or, I never knew what it was saying or something like that. And it means so much more to them, though they've sung these songs for you know, decades. And I'm sure the same is uh, true for us. We've had that experience as well. So it's good yeah, to talk about the songs that we sing and use them kind of like you do, Mac, as 
um, a, a hook point, you know, a, a way to to bring people into what we're the content that we're trying to teach. All right. Well, I think that's uh, probably enough now. We could talk a lot more about songs. And like I say, check out that issue of the Journal of Christian Studies. And uh, we'll wrap it up here. But thanks, Mac, for joining us today yeah. for this conversation. Um, I, think it's, I think it's been really helpful and appreciate your uh, being a good sport with this. So thank you all for listening to Theological Table Talk. Uh, follow or subscribe to this podcast on Spotify or Apple if you have not yet. Um, and these episodes are also available on our Center for Christian Studies YouTube channel on video there. So give the podcast a like and a five-star review um, if you would. And as I said, share a comment or um, even a question for us to discuss. If you have uh, suggested topics or guests that you would like to see, um, then email us at info at christian-studies.org. And there, check out the Center for Christian Studies at christian-studies.org. If you like what you see on the website, if you like what you've heard here on the podcast, then just hit that little give button there and, uh, and send a, a gift our way. But thanks for joining us today at the table for Theological Table Talk. Until next time.